Anybody who has ever seen a lightning storm has at least a passing appreciation of electricity. Certainly anybody who takes the time to consider all of the myriad electrical devices we use would have a more than passing appreciation. Yet there is more to electricity than atmospheric terrors and marvelous mechanisms. Life itself is subtly woven with electrical currents, inherent to the function of every neuron and muscle cell. It is easy enough to imagine electricity as a flow of electrons through a copper wire, yet it also takes the form of the flow of dissolved ions across living cell membranes. Our every action generates shifting electrical fields too weak for us to sense, yet there are creatures that can detect even these slight shifts in voltage. An entire world of perception is available to such creatures that is quite alien to us. To properly understand the electrical senses, we must first have at least a basic understanding of electricity itself. Such an understanding must include concepts of charge, voltage, current, resistance, and electrical fields. To begin with, charges can be positive or negative. Opposite charges attract, while like charges repel one another. Since positive and negative charges are attracted to one another, it takes energy to separate them. Thus, separated charges are effectively a form of stored energy. To be more specific, it is a form of potential energy, sometimes known as an electrical potential. This electrical potential is essentially voltage. Every charge generates an electrical field around itself. This field is merely an expression of the force experienced by another charge within said field. If two opposite charges are separated, they also generate an electrical field. Charged particles, like ions for example, will experience a force within this field, causing them to move if there is a viable path. A stronger voltage generates a stronger electrical field. Whenever charges are in motion, this is effectively an electrical current. A voltage causes an electrical current, provided the charges are free to move. This degree of freedom, or rather the lack thereof, is often described as electrical resistance. In some substances, there are many available charges and even a low voltage can produce an appreciable electrical current. These substances tend to be referred to as electrical conductors. There are other substances that don't readily allow for charges to flow. These are electrical insulators. Conductors have a low resistance, and insulators have a high resistance. So for future reference, let us consider three basic substances. Air, fresh water, and seawater. Air is a strong electrical insulator, because there are very few charged particles in typical air, as well as relatively little contact between air molecules. It requires a tremendous voltage to overcome this resistance. Essentially, the voltage has to get so high that the air molecules are ripped apart and ionized, generating a path for current. This involves a tremendous release of heat and light, and is commonly known as a bolt of lightning. Water is far better at conducting electricity than air, and this is why electroreception is nearly always confined to aquatic creatures rather than landbound ones. In water, the resistance is low enough to allow for electroreceptors to actually be useful. This is also why one finds a certain species of electricity producing fish in the water but nothing comparable on land. If a creature on land wanted to wield electricity as a weapon at a distance, it would need to effectively generate lightning bolts. This would require a ridiculous amount of energy for a typical animal to produce. Even if it were somehow successful, the resulting phenomenon would most likely cook the wielder in the process. Regarding conductivity within water, there is a further difference to consider. 
Fresh water, such as that found in lakes and rivers, has relatively low ion concentrations, so it isn't a very good conductor. Thus, the electrogenic fish found in fresh water need to generate an appreciable voltage to have any noticeable effect. In contrast, seawater is quite rich in available charges. It is salty after all, and dissolved salt is synonymous with dissolved ions, which in turn means charged particles in the water. This is why such electricity carriers are sometimes known as electrolytes. Thus, marine electrogenic fish can induce a proper electrical field in the surrounding water with a much lower voltage. This difference in conductivity leads to a fundamental difference in the electrogenic organs of freshwater fish versus marine fish, but we will come to that in due time. For the moment, let us consider electricity within more generalized animal systems. Both neurons and muscle cells are of particular interest here. These cells, like other animal cells, contain a type of protein in their membranes known as the sodium-potassium pumps. These pumps consume chemical energy produced by the cell to move sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions into the cell. The result, when combined with a few potassium leakage channels, is an accumulation of positive charge outside of the cell membrane and negative charge inside. A separation of charges, also known as a membrane potential, or a membrane voltage, and a form of potential energy. There are other ion channel proteins in the membranes of certain cells that only open under certain stimuli. For example, there are voltage-gated sodium channels in the axons of neurons, as well as the membranes of muscle cells. When these proteins encounter an appropriate shift in voltage, they will open, letting sodium enter the cell. This depolarizes the cell and even leaves the interior surface slightly positive for a brief time. Voltage-gated potassium channels open shortly thereafter, restoring the normal membrane potential. One might ask what the point of all of this might be. This temporary voltage shift sets off nearby voltage-gated channels and so spreads out over the cell membrane. Or rather, down the length of the axon or over the entire muscle cell. One might think of it as a wave of temporary depolarization followed by a wave of repolarization. It is effectively a type of electrical signal, known as an action potential, which signals neurons to release neurotransmitters and signals muscles to contract. Now, in some cases, either muscle cells or neurons can be modified into special voltage-generating cells, sometimes called electrocytes. These form the basis of the electrogenic organs in electric fish. These electric fish and their electrocytes will be the subject of the second part of this two-video series. So, for now, rather than going into the fine details of electrocytes, it would probably be best to briefly consider the electrical receptors found in most types of electric fish, as well as a great many other species. These receptors can detect minute changes in voltage, which are reflections of shifting electrical fields in the surrounding environment. A fairly standard sort of electroreceptor is the ampulla of Lorenzini, ampullae plural, found in sharks and other cartilaginous fish. These particular receptors are also found in several types of bony fish, as well as certain amphibians. It would appear that these electroreceptors are quite ancient, possessed by the earliest of vertebrates. Most lineages have lost them, though, including the majority of bony fish species. However, a few electric fish have developed comparable electroreceptors with different anatomical details. A couple of examples would be the Nolanorgan receptor type and the Mormiramast receptor type found in the family Mormiridae. To return to the ancestral electroreceptors, the ampullae appear to be modifications of the mechanoreceptors that form part of the lateral line system of typical fish. Each of these receptors is located within the skin and consists of a bundle of sensory cells within a sensory bulb which connects to a gel-filled canal that ends with a pore at the skin's surface. 
The gel is fairly conductive, about on par with seawater. The receptor cells inside the bulb respond to even weak electrical fields, or more specifically, they respond to the voltage difference between the outer pore and the receptor epithelium within the bulb. Different voltages result in different firing rates from the neurons attached to the receptor cells. Sharks and their relatives have many of these electroreceptors embedded in their skin, particularly about the head. They appear as tiny pits in the surface, at least in the case of these particular fish. However, with the exception of a few electric rays and skates, these fish do not have any dedicated electrogenic organs. In fact, this is quite a common pattern seen in members of many different vertebrate groups. Electrical receptors, but no organ dedicated to generating an electrical field. Beyond the sharks and their relatives, we find this pattern in several groups of bony fish, including lungfish and coelacanths, certain types of aquatic salamander, some varieties of Sicilian amphibians, and even the platypus and echidna. One might ask what the point of such receptors is, without any accompanying field generators. The answer comes back to nerve and muscle tissue. Every time the ions in these tissues move, every time electrical signals are sent, this alters the local electrical field. Effectively, the temporary movements of ions, or in other words, charges, creates little electrical and magnetic fields. These fields are pretty weak when it is just a single axon or a single muscle cell. In practice, though, it is often quite a few cells working in tandem. Every time an animal moves, it alters the electrical field that surrounds it. In water, and seawater in particular, these fields tend to be functionally easier to read. So the electrical receptors are a means of perceiving other animals nearby. This may include potential prey or possible predators. One might suggest simply not moving as a defense. The necessity of breathing makes this a bit more difficult. Besides this, the nervous system must remain at least somewhat active for the simple maintenance of life functions. Even holding one's breath, though, there is one relatively constant electrical signal every vertebrate must give off. That is, the shifting electrical field associated with every heartbeat. Placing a series of electrodes on a person's skin in specific locations is sufficient to detect and analyze their heartbeat. A fish in the water must inevitably give off a regular rhythmic beacon, however faint, announcing its presence. To use a metaphor then, it is as though a creature makes a sound every time it moves, and indeed with every heartbeat, and these receptors allow sharks and the like to listen in on these sounds. I should emphasize that the actual physics involved are quite different, and such a metaphor should be handled with care. Still, there is a bit more use we might gain. It is one thing to passively listen, it is quite another to engage in echolocation. A creature might emit a sound itself, and listen for whatever sound waves are reflected back to it. This gives it a picture of its environment. Similarly, a fish with a proper electrogenic organ is capable of electrolocation. It generates an electrical field around itself, and if it has electrical receptors, it can detect changes in this electrical field. The sorts of changes one might see when an object with different conductivity to the surrounding water gets close enough to the fish. Indeed, most of the freshwater electrical fish tend to live in rather turbid, murky waters where eyesight isn't terribly useful. Their electrical equivalent to echolocation gives them a solid perception of their surroundings. In addition, any nearby animal life is highlighted quite sharply, as such life inevitably generates its own little fields with every twitch of its muscles and every heartbeat, in the case of those species that have hearts. After all, many smaller aquatic invertebrates are more or less heartless, for all intents and purposes. Let us conclude for today with a look at some of the more unexpected species with electrical senses. One of these species is Proteus sanguinus, a type of salamander known as the Ulm. These pale, slender creatures live in cave systems, where they use a combination of chemoreception, hearing, and electrical senses in place of vision. They have tiny remnants of eyes, but are functionally blind. 
There are other aquatic salamanders that also possess electroreceptors, though few if any are quite as extreme as the ulm in their forms and habits. Another rather extreme sort of creature is the lamprey. There are over 30 known species of lamprey alive today. Typically, these creatures are spawned in rivers, and their juvenile forms tend to live as passive filter feeders buried in the sediment. When they reach adulthood, some lamprey species simply spawn and die shortly thereafter. Other species migrate downriver to the sea, where they live as blood-sucking ectoparasites of larger fish. A classic example of this pattern is the sea lamprey, Petromyzon marinus. Incidentally, the scientific name of this creature roughly translates into the stone sucker of the sea. While typically oceanic, these creatures are also an invasive species in the Great Lakes region. One might suppose that the electroreceptors of the lampreys allow them to more efficiently locate potential hosts. While electroreceptors are relatively common in fish and amphibians, they are rarely found elsewhere. One such case is the Guiana dolphin, Sotalia guianensis. The receptors in this cetacean are located on the snout as a series of hairless vibrissal crypts. Essentially, these are the equivalents of structures that give rise to whiskers in many other mammal species. They have apparently been repurposed into electrical sensors, which no doubt work quite well in seawater. The only other mammals known to have this unique sort of sense are the monotremes, that is, the echidna and the platypus. Thus far, the echidna is the only known example of a non-aquatic creature with functional electroreceptors. However, this is as yet poorly studied and there is little information on the possible function of such a sense in these creatures. In contrast, the function of the electroreceptors in the platypus is fairly clear. These receptors are located on the bill of the platypus, along with a number of sensitive mechanoreceptors. This creature hunts for food in rivers, but it does so with its eyes closed. It relies upon these subtler senses to detect its invertebrate prey as it rummages through the riverbed. Next time, we will conclude this look into living electricity with a proper consideration of the electrogenic fish. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have enjoyed today's little foray into the unknown. If you are still curious and wish to venture a little further, here are a few things you might consider looking into. If you found this video enjoyable, do feel free to leave a like. If you believe others might enjoy it, by all means, share. If you wish to see more of this channel, a subscription should prove quite helpful. Until next time.